Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell. Today I'm bringing to you Associate Professor Andrew Coggan from Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, IUPUI. Um, he's an expert on um, all sorts of things. He's done a lot of training studies, a lot of tracer studies looking at metabolism, but he's also got a very interesting background that he was an elite uh, time trialist, um, having won time trials in four different states in America. And he also brought out a book called Training and Racing with Power with Hunter Allen. So this is where he talked about functional threshold power and the seven different levels of training to uh, achieve your goals. Um, this then, then sort of morphed into a lot of different sort of uh, training zone uh, discussions. So, you know, five zones, seven zones, eight zones. And then more recently, a lot of discussion about this zone two training where people feel like if you're not training uh, at a relatively low intensity, then uh, you will not be learning how to burn fat. And that will mean you have uh, suboptimal responses to training. So we talk about this and as you'll see, uh, Andy is not a big fan of this sort of, uh, you know, obsession about, about training in particular zones. And we talk about how, you know, there's plenty of ways to skin a cat, as he says, or the concept of all roads lead to Rome. And he says, you know, rather than worrying about these exact zones you're training in, worry about training specificity um, and what you want to gain from your training. So a very interesting discussion. I think you'll enjoy it and learn a lot. So stick around. Hi, Andy. Welcome back to Inside Exercise. Thank you very much for coming on. How, how oh, are thanks, you? Glenn. Um, yeah. I'm happy to be back. I'm doing well. <laughs> on, on vacation down here in sunny Florida. Yes. So you were saying, and I thought it was very nice of you to, to want to come on while you're actually on vacation, that um, you wanted to hit these grant deadlines and then uh, go down to sunny Florida. So did you hit the grant deadlines? Uh, I didn't hit all the deadlines, no. <laughs> oh, crap, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I've got uh, two things I'm working on that have to be done even while I'm still here. So oh, you know, man. it never ends. So you'll be in trouble with the family, won't you? For no, I, I warned my wife in advance that I was doing a podcast, so, and she was okay, okay. with it. <laughs> All right, good. So, so you've already been on, as I said, so we, you're actually the first, so thank you very much for being the first one to come on where we had, we, we had like zero views at that point, obviously, um, and it's built up, so that was great, and you were actually almost, almost the uh, unofficial advisory board as well, <laughs> because you were giving me a lot of tips, and we were running ideas past, so we go back a long way. I met you in 1991, I think it was, uh, when you were down, you came down and you popped into Mark Hargrave's lab while I was doing my PhD. Right, right, yeah. And, a uh, yeah. a self-financed sabbatical is how I described it. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so you've got a very strong background. For people that don't know, you've got a very strong background for, for many, many years looking at all sorts of things, the like training studies, tracer studies, actual actual guy for a while there you were my go-to guy to ask questions about traces and things and now you've been after me nagging you substantially you've been happy enough to come on to talk about zone two you know training at different zones and all these sort of ideas about uh if you if you don't train that exact zone the world might come to an end um you were not that keen to come on because that is not your scientific background but uh the fact that you've written a book on this stuff and you were like the first to start thinking about training with power. Um, I think it's great to have you on. Yeah, I, I consider that I am not, you know, I am not a sports scientist. I'm not an applied sports scientist. I'm an exercise physiologist like you. Uh, however, as a cyclist myself and a numbers guy, when power meters became affordable uh, and really started to catch on, you know, just before the turn of the century, I got sucked into that rabbit hole. And since I'm a, a person with a lot of opinions, I started sharing them online. And the next thing you know, I'm you know doing lectures for USA Cycling. And then Hunter Allen is, you know, uh, bending my arm and we end up writing a book and, you know, it all just snowballed from there. But I really, I always considered that hobby. You know, yep. avocation, not vocation. It was a sidelight. Uh, so, so you touched on it there, and I should say, when you came down to <laughs> down to Melbourne, we went for a bike ride, and um, I knew you were already strong, but um, I didn't expect you just to like ride away. I was like, it pissed me off, actually. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, oh, you were a of, runner, though, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, specificity. I mean, you, you just put the hammer down and you were gone. Specificity, yeah. yeah. Exactly. All right, so why don't you give us a bit of an idea, and it also tracks your scientific um, journey as well, that you were started off in Indiana, you were like Indiana time trial champ. Tell, take us through that, no modesty. Now. Yeah, I, start, I started, I grew up in Indiana, I started riding a bike when I was 14, racing when I was a 15, when I was 15, uh, you know, that was my identity. Uh, that got me interested in exercise physiology while I was still a junior in high school. So Ball State was just down the road. So I did my undergraduate and my master's there with Dave Costell. Uh, my first exposure to power-based training was actually when I was an undergraduate. Uh, Costell wrote me a winter training program on the ergometer, you know, three days a week. But all of the, uh, you know, I was doing intervals that had uh, wattage targets, right? It wasn't heart rate based training or anything like that. It was, you know, do this interval at this duration at this power output and then try and push it up from there. Mm. Uh, so, but then, uh, yeah, I, I always consider myself the cycling equivalent of the, of a, like a 218 marathoner. I was, I was good enough to dream, right? <laughs> not, not good enough to make a living at it. Um, yeah, but good enough to dream <laughs> uh, well you some of your dreams came true though Is, isn't it correct that you were time trial champion in indiana and then you went to to missouri well, yeah, and a time when, trial champion there and when, i was part way through my master's degree when i committed myself to science rather than cycling and i made cycling a hobby but you know, i'm a lifer uh, exerciser and you like to stay fit so <laughs> everywhere i went i would try and find you know some competitive outlet and since i'm skewed well to the slow twitch end of the spectrum i was always good at time trials and i like the technical aspects the aerodynamics so yeah i made it a goal and so i won the time trial in indiana and then uh let's see moved to texas and uh you know won a time trial championship down there and then moved to you know, maryland and ohio and uh, Missouri, and it's like every state I would be at, I would try and take out the TT championship. Um, best we ever did, we actually won the uh, Masters National time trial on a tandem in our, oh. our 90 plus age group as a Masters. And then we went out to New Mexico and set, it's been since been broken, but we set the, uh, the US uh, tandem time trial record for our age group. Um, so nothing like motoring along at a tan on a tandem at 32 miles with? an hour. Uh, John Ver John Verhuel, okay. uh, who's he's an environmental attorney out there now, but uh, he was a cycling coach before he uh, went back to law school. I just remember and, while you were talking about that. Sorry that 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 you were wired into that with the aerodynamics and you had that hooker elite. Why don't you explain yes. that 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 was? I'd never seen anything like that. Uh, but, at yeah, that time, they, they were a company uh, actually. Uh, hooker industries, hooker headers. There's a couple of guys in California who are very much into auto racing, drag racing, uh, modifying cars. And then they got sucked into the triathlon explosion, et cetera, and, and started doing that. And they decided to apply their technical expertise and their ability with metallurgy and develop a bike brand. So they were one of the very first uh, you know, full aero uh, efforts out there. And uh, it was pretty extreme and radical for the time. And of course, things have moved on quite a bit since then. But uh, yeah. yeah so, so you had no, there's no, no handlebars, right? Basically. Arrow or die. Yeah, it was, it was arrow or die. No, no outboard position whatsoever, right? Handlebars <laughs> were like this wide at the well, widest you're part. You're showing but, about for people, I think 15 centimeters, maybe six inches wide. Yeah. yeah. So you just had your arms forward and that was it. Yep. And I remember you telling me to get arrow. And you were like, just push no down. You were pushing me, pushing my back down. And I just couldn't, yeah. I couldn't do it because, because you would just train like at that, when you were leading up to time trial, you would just train in that position the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I also, you know, I grew up in, in Northern Indiana where it's pretty flat and kind of windy and empty farm roads. I got quite used to just hunkering down and riding with my head down. So from a young age. So uh, there are actually data out there showing that in speed skaters, for example, the, uh, the, thigh, the hip joint angle force relationship is skewed to a more acute angle. 
in speed skaters than it is in untrained individuals. So okay. I think, you know, if you, if you're doing that from a young age, you develop a little bit differently and then you can picture somebody who like yourself, who is a runner first, right. In an upright mm -hmm. posture. And then in, you know, full adulthood, you try to become a cyclist. You may be at a disadvantage to somebody who's been doing it since they were 14 or 15. I just couldn't for the life of me. So you had your, you had your hips. I mean, I know we know this stuff now, but back then I was just like, what the hell <laughs> your, your hips were above your, uh, shoulders. Yeah. Is that what it was? Uh, no, hang no. on. I mean, no, you, you don't. You don't get quite that low, but no, uh, it wasn't that yeah. low. I, I had a lot of good input from uh, various people: John Cobb, Jim Martin, etc. And you were mucking around in um, in um, tunnels. Um, era. Oh, I yeah, I got I got uh, into the wind tunnel for the very first tunnels. time in uh, I don't know what year that was, um, but again, that was courtesy of uh, connected with Jim. Um, yeah. Then I eventually okay. built built my own wind tunnel in my That's basement. Right. That's right. <laughs> Hard call, man. It's it's not a big wind tunnel, but <laughs> I did build one. All right. So so if we we're going to lead towards uh, focusing around this zone two concept, which um, to be honest, I hadn't heard all that much about until you know I started on Twitter. I'd heard about it, but then you know with Twitter with this this podcast, and uh, it just keeps coming up all over the place. And the zone two and zone two A and zone two B and and various ideas about zones. Do you want to just talk about how we how people sort of got into these zones and indeed your own um, you know zones that you had with your functional threshold power et cetera? Yes, uh, I don't know who the first person who would have been who would have proposed training zones, uh, or even when it might have been, but certainly as a uh, young young and growing up, I think I was exposed to the notion of heart rate based training zones. Then when uh, power meters started to catch on, it was actually a, a chance conversation with John Verhuel in the uh, infield at Trexler Town at the velodrome there. He uh, was part of a coaching company at the time that had their own heart rate based training zones. Mm -hmm. And he saw, realized that power was taking off and he was telling the person he was talking to, they're talking about Watts, et cetera. And he was telling this person that he was talking to that he wanted to be the, you know, be the first to translate their heart rate based zones to, to power based zones. So it was about a two hour drive home from T-Town to where I was living in Maryland at the time. And I left the velodrome and I'm driving home and I'm thinking as I go, well, there's really a power vacuum here. You know, pardon the pun, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, SRM had been available to the Greg LeMans of the world, for, uh, the Australian Institute of Sport for maybe, you know, eight years or so. But at that level, people are not in the business of sharing all of their hard-won knowledge. They're trying to, you mm -hmm. know, win medals and make money and keep all of their secrets to themselves. So there wasn't a lot of information out there. And I'm driving home, and of course, I have an ego as big as the... Uh, um, golf here that I'm sitting right next to and said to myself, it's like, well, you know, somebody needs to step up and, you know, fill this void. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was the perfect person because of my background in exercise physiology and the fact that I had gotten uh, early exposure, you know, I jumped on the power bandwagon. So I started out by developing uh, my seven training levels mm -hmm. and uh, power-based training levels. But the uh, on the wattage list when i used to participate we would have what we referred to as pithy power proverbs short little phrases that summarized a concept you get tired of trying to explain it over and over again so you end up with a shorthand notation okay and the the, the relevant pithy power proverb here is uh they're called levels and not zones for a reason and that is uh, when people are training on the basis of heart rate and heart rate based zones, they have this notion that, well, if I'm doing a zone X workout, then I just you know, modulate my exercise intensity to keep my uh, heart rate within that range at all times. Mm -hmm. And the problem is when you apply that to power on a bicycle, your power when cycling outdoors is highly variable. I mean, People know this, but they're still surprised when they get a power meter. But yeah. if you think about it, mm -hmm. when you're pedaling, your power is something. 
and then you coast as you go around the corner and your power is zero. And then you stand up to accelerate again and now you get a spike in power. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you then apply a, a typical zone sort of perspective and you try and constrain your power output to keep it always in the same range, you become a diesel engine. You become a lorry, mm -hmm. right? It's not the way we ride bicycles and it's counterproductive to the overall effects of training because you need to be able to change speed, right? Take a, take a triathlete, throw them into a mass start bike race and they get eaten alive, right? Because they're not used to changing. So, their, yeah. yeah. So they're riding like a time trial the whole way. Yep. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I did is I borrowed the word levels from uh, Chris Boardman's coach, Peter Keene had his own system, right? Which he referred to different levels. And I thought, well, levels at least hopefully will make people think differently than zone. Um, and then it all sort of snowballed from there. You know, USA Cycling caught wind, asked me to give talks. Hunter Allen sucked me in. We ended up with three editions of our book. You know, 100,000 plus copies sold, eight different mm. languages. <laughs> wow. Mm. Made, a, made a lot of other people's careers um, for what for me was really just a hobby. <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it in Slovenian? No. <laughs> with Fogger Fogger Not Fogger to my knowledge, no. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, Roglic and Pogacar, right? They're both Slovenian. First and second. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. We might head Slo in that direction. Slovenian or Slovakian? Stage. Are they Slovenian uh, or Slovenian? No, Slovakian? Slovenian. Slovenian, I okay. think. Okay. Um, all right. So there's going to be controversies along the way. And one, one I just thought of is, um, I mean, it might be a bit of a tangent, which is what you said. You said we should have uh, a bit of a, a script because we, we tend to go off on tangents. But um, what was the deal with your, uh, there's a suffer score, yeah? And then there's your FTP and there was a bit of a, a bit of a controversy at Trainer Road or something about whether you should use suffer score instead of FTP or have I got that wrong? Well, uh, the starting point was the training levels, mm -hmm. but the Endurance exercise performance, the single most important physiologically determined of, of endurance exercise performance is your, what I call your muscular metabolic fitness mm -hmm. uh, as, as a counterpoint to cardiovascular fitness describing VO2 max. Mm -hmm. And our, our lab-based measurement, the, the standard lab-based measurement of muscular metabolic fitness is lactate threshold. Now mm -hmm. there are at least 27 different quantitative definitions of lactate threshold out there in the scientific literature, right? Uh, and, but as a concept, uh, it, also, it can also be just viewed as a concept, right? And the fact that it's a, a well-established concept is probably why we don't why there are 27 different definitions mm -hmm. in that if you go to a meeting and you say, yeah, you know, we were testing this cyclist and his, their lactate threshold was really close to their VO2 max, right? You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know which definition I was using, right? Yeah. And if you got really curious and you wanted to say, well, how close, you know, oh, it was at 98%. Well, how are you measuring lactate threshold? Yeah. Oh, we use, you know, we use the one millimolar increase above exercise baseline. It's like, oh, okay, go on, right? Um, yeah, exactly. So as I describe it, there isn't any evolutionary pressure in the field to achieve any kind of standardization because there really isn't a need from a conceptual right. point of view, right? We can still communicate with each other. Um, so, you know, with that in mind, knowing that you're, metabolic responses are the most important determinant of performance. And I grew up as the concept of lactate threshold was developing, right? And displacing VO2 max as the be all and end all. And even as a grad student, okay, now what, 40 years ago, <laughs> I, I, I was saying, you know, the best predictor of performance is performance itself. Yeah, right? Just, uh, it, yeah. it always will be, right? There's a perfect correlation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there are physiological descriptors of it, but uh, you don't want the, the tail wagging the dog. Performance mm -hmm. trumps all, right? So now we have power meters on bikes. We have the ability to measure someone's performance ability in terms of their power output. We know that their muscular metabolic fitness uh, connects to, you know, predicts performance across a very broad range of durations, right? 
So the logical anchor point is a power output uh, that is a surrogate for the lactate threshold concept, right? Yep. Well, the, the other issue is, you know, and coaches and athletes are so confused because if you use some of the definitions of lactate threshold, you know, the first apparent increase, you know, above resting or something like that, it's a far lower exercise intensity than what athletes and coaches perceive to be threshold. And that creates confusion. What? You're telling me my threshold is this? I know it's this right they come yeah. out of the laboratory so that's the we, thing so, so can i just say so so for example as you said there's all these different definitions of lactate threshold so so you know the classic one is is you know you just so people are on the same page so your lactate you know people might think oh there's no lactate sitting here at rest but your lactate level is about one millimole or so at rest then you start exercise but it's still low intensity and it stays about one and it doesn't really change so, so people might think oh nothing's happened but in fact you're producing lactate at a higher rate but you're clearing it at, at the same mm -hmm. rate so it's not accumulating and then it starts to accumulate right and then some people okay that's lactate threshold one other people say no no let's not worry about that just wait until it's one millimole above that resting level but as you're saying you could do like a one hour time trial and sit at five or six millimoles right. or seven lactate. or eight actually exactly uh, okay. con con connected to that and for the edification of your audience you know to me it if people think about it why is the onset of blood lactate accumulation defined as four millimolar? Mm -hmm. I mean, if mm -hmm. resting is one, you're saying, well, wait a minute, you've already accumulated a whole lot. So why do we call yes. that the onset? So mm -hmm. I think that the, to understand that you have to learn to think in multiple dimensions, because not only do we have to think about intensity, but we also have to think about duration. Mm -hmm. So OBLA, four millimolar, is the average lactate concentration across uh, various you know, runners, swimmers, rowers, cyclists, corresponding to maximal lactate steady state. Mm -hmm. So if you are well below, you know, if, you're, if it's a very low intensity, you may not see any accumulation of lactate at all. If it's a uh, slightly higher intensity, your lactate levels may go up initially, but then after 20, 30 minutes, they go back down towards resting exactly. levels. If you go a little bit harder, they go up and they'll plateau. If you go a little bit harder still, they'll go up and they'll plateau. If you go a little bit harder still, they increase continuously. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that happens on average at about a four millimole level, but it seems to be dependent upon the amount of muscle mass, the mode of exercise. So for cyclists, at least trained cyclists, quite typically maximal lactate steady state corresponds to a blood lactate concentration of maybe seven millimolar. Mm -hmm. So yeah, back to the 4K, 40 kilometer TT, you know, your average trained, well-trained cyclist is probably just sitting there at seven millimolar for the duration of the event. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what do they do with that? So, you know, if they had a lactate threshold, if they'd, if they'd actually gone in and paid to have a lactate threshold test done, what do they do with that? My feeling was always that <laughs> I'm throwing up my hands here. <laughs> like, I don't know. I mean, it's a one-off yeah. test. Um, mm. You know, it, it would tell you uh, what your physiological state is at the, you know, the day you took the test, but uh, unless you go back repeatedly, it's exactly. not really useful for tracking improvements. The other thing is that it's far more variable than what people realize. Uh, you know, we can reproduce performance, you know, plus or minus 2% in a laboratory setting. In the field, because it's not a controlled laboratory setting, maybe plus or minus 5%, right? Um, but then when you talk about measurement of, you know, some lactate threshold surrogate, right? The coefficient of variation is, is quite a bit larger. The test, retest reproducibility mm -hmm. isn't that great because lactate depends upon you know, how much glycogen you have stored in your muscles, et cetera. Um, so again, people have it, they think that lab-based testing is the gold standard and everything else is a poor man's substitute and they have it backwards. The best predictor of performance, performance. is performance itself. Uh, exactly. And you know, lab-based testing is the poor man's substitute or it is the, uh, yeah, it may, help you understand things mechanistically if you're a scientist but it's not the gold standard and this is one thing that i do uh would say that i agree with in the perspective that andy jones is and uh, david Poole have tried to put out there in pushing uh critical power as the new gold standard and that uh they are also you know of the opinion that 
uh, performance trumps all. Um, okay, so why don't you, um, we're, we're heading, we're sort of heading, heading towards zone two, but we need this sort of background. Seeing as you've mentioned critical power, uh, why don't you just explain what, what that is and for our listeners? Uh, critical power was first developed by Monad et al. in the 1950s, uh, a mathematical model to describe performance over varying durations uh, with small muscle mass exercise. Let's say repeated knee extension, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, conceptually, you have a critical power that can be maintained indefinitely, infinitively, forever, right? And above that, you have a limited amount of work that you can do. So if you are at or below your critical power, you should never fatigue. Mm -hmm. And then if you're above your critical power, how quickly you would fatigue would depend upon uh, the magnitude of your, originally it was referred to as anaerobic work capacity. Now the realization is that it's, uh, for the last couple of decades is it's not entirely anaerobic. So the, now it is W prime, W for work. Um, so you have a certain non-sustainable reserve and the higher you are above critical power, the more quickly you will deplete it. The uh, less you're above your critical power, the longer it will last, but eventually you will deplete it and have to slow down to critical power. Yeah. So that's the concept uh, proposed again in 56 or so. It took until 1979 until DeVries uh, and Moritani extended it to whole body exercise using cycling. And there are various mathematical permutations on this. You know, you can either plot work against time or, uh, you know, one over power versus time, et cetera, different manipulations, but it comes down to a two parameter model of the exercise intensity duration relationship. It started out again, primarily as a, a mathematical descriptor. And then people began to develop more and more physiological basis for it or impetus for us, impetus for it. Um, and I'm going to let you get a word in edgewise here, because otherwise I'll just go no, off no. on a real long tangent. No, that's good. I'm just, I guess I'm wondering what do you actually do, do with that? So, um, well, you know, it's, it's, a, it, all models are wrong, but some are useful, right? Uh, mathematical models often are better at, uh, generating new questions than they are actually ask, answering current questions, uh, but one example of it, you can, instead of using power, you can use pace. And so you can talk, talk about your critical pace and your, uh, your D prime, your distance prime. Mm -hmm. So for my son, who's a swimmer, I use his, uh, his 100, 200, and 500 yard distances. And I use a linear variation of the critical pace model. And so I track uh, improvements in his critical swimming speed and critical distance, uh, you know, as he develops, et cetera, et cetera. Now, given that, you know, performance, the best predictor of performance is performance itself. If you want to have a uh, zone system, and I'll come back to that in just a second, mm -hmm. uh, the logical anchor point is performance, not maximal heart rate, not VO2 max, even though historically in exercise physiology, we describe exercise intensity as a percentage of VO2 max. Uh, that's really only the best approach if you're talking about cardiovascular responses, because it's a measure of cardiovascular fitness. Uh, more generally, anchoring things on quote unquote lactate threshold, muscular metabolic fitness makes a lot more sense. Um, so you could build an entire uh, you know, zone-based system around critical power. And, mm -hmm. but obviously we're getting, you know, off in the weeds here and talking about mathematics, right? Mm -hmm. And all this kind of stuff. And power meters for cyclists are just becoming available. And the problem is people are really confused because they think they all want to be scientists, right? So mm -hmm. my attempt to kind of cut through all of the confusion was just to wipe the slate clean and say, forget about the physiology. You don't need to understand the physiology. 
but you know that there's a certain intensity that you can sustain, right? I can hold this. And if I ask you to go a little bit harder, you're going to very quickly realize I can't keep this up, right? Functionally speaking, there is a quote unquote threshold power, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a true threshold because all exercise responses reside on a continuum, including lactate and ventilation. Um, so to refer to things as a threshold is a, is a mental convenience. We simplify everything down and we draw a hard line in the sand and we call it, you know, black and white. You're above your threshold, you're below your threshold. When in reality, it's a curvilinear relationship with a, you know, narrow bend in it, uh, but it's clearly still bending even in that range. Um, but nonetheless, let's forget about lactate, forget about everything you know. Let's just talk about functionally speaking, you have a threshold power. And this can become a good anchor point for, well, how do we communicate people? I told my athlete to go easy. They have a power meter. Well, how easy is easy, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's how the original training levels were born. Um, and I think the entire purpose of training levels or zones or whatever, is really just a language to aid in communication. Um, you know, there's nothing magic that occurs about training at a particular uh, intensity that wouldn't occur if you went just a little bit harder or just a little bit easier because it's all a continuum. But if you need to, you know, I'm a graphic person. I can sit here and draw lines and graphs and, you know, all day long. But if you're trying to communicate with somebody in language, um, you need some kind of systematic approach. And that was the, the basis, the original training levels. Yes. Now, with uh, when I first started hearing about zone two and tried to work out what it was, I actually thought it was it was talking about your second level, but it's but it's not. So why don't we talk about what zone two is and how uh, there's a bit of a prevailing view that you if you want to increase your fat oxidation and et cetera, you need to sit in zone two and uh, try not to deviate. And then maybe some of the physiology behind that. Um, yeah, you know, probably this, mm. at least some of the confusion that's out there is due to the fact that there are multiple systems. Um, at the simplest, you have uh, the Norwegian approach, I guess you'd say Norwegian, that Seiler always embraces, where you really only have different, three different ranges, right? Um, in which case, you know, it's one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. So two is the middle one. <laughs> um, uh, when I was developing my training levels and trying to think about, well, how do cyclists train in order to prepare for competition, I decided that seven was the magic number. Mm -hmm. that, se that seven was sufficient to cover all the bases. And uh, you know, I couldn't get by with one less and I didn't want to go with one more because it made it unnecessarily complicated. Um, if you're going on heart rate, well, you know, any heart rate based system is capped at maximal heart rate. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah, it doesn't really apply to, you know, super maximal above VO2 max efforts. So the most common heart rate based system, probably Joe Friel's, I'd guess, has five, right? All right. So, okay, you know, one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, um, but all of these twos don't necessarily perfectly align. <laughs> no. Um, you know, it's uh, in the history of training for endurance sports. Uh, I say Zapotec. You said Zapotec? Uh, Zapotec, oh. I thought it was. Email yeah. Zapotec. Well, you, you, you're the runner. So, yes, you're yeah. the runner. We'll, we'll go with your pronunciation. Okay. Um you know, credited with inventing interval training and then the, the whole no pain, no gain era to follow, it was a reaction to that where Joe Henderson published his popular book on uh, long, slow distance training, the humane way to train. Uh, no more, you know, torturing yourself day in and day out with vomit inducing intervals. You can go out and just run at a steady pace, et cetera. Um, so he really popularized it, even though you would say that, uh, um, uh, from New Zealand, who's the uh, Lydiard. Uh, Lydia. you know, Lydiard certainly had people yeah. doing, you know, plenty of endurance-based training. Um, mm -hmm. So it would be, you know, zone two is long, slow distance. It's all day pace. It's, you know, it's a comfortable pace. It's, uh, you know, we, we all know it when we see it, right? Um, but in each different system, it's, 
there may be overlap, but they don't necessarily overlap perfectly. And then people want to try and tie it to some physiological marker, which doesn't make a lot of sense because most people don't have access to the physiological measurements. It doesn't make a lot of sense because it's all a continuum anyway. It doesn't make a lot of sense because the best predictor of performance is performance itself. It doesn't make a lot of sense because, you know, performance is a function of your muscular metabolic fitness, which is the most important determinant of performance over a very broad range of intensities. So, you know, why are you trying to tie it to, you know, LT1, right? As if LT1 is different from LT2. They're not, you know. Um, Actually, sorry, just explain that to people, what you're talking about with LT1 and LT2 and why you're saying that they're not different. Well, okay, lactate threshold, LT, if you're plotting mm -hmm. lactate as a function of exercise intensity, let's say during an incremental exercise test, uh, now, the absolute lactate levels are going to depend upon you know, your current glycogen stores, your, uh, you know, the length of the stage increment, uh, whether you're measuring lactate in venous blood, arterialized blood, arterial blood, whether you're talking about whole blood lactate uh, or plasma lactate. And maybe even if you're doing the, you know, capillary blood, it may differ depending on whether you're getting an ear prick or a finger prick. And um, if you see how much you squeeze it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Or how much sweat gets in it or the particular brand, the handheld analyzer you own, you know, there's a million sources mm -hmm. of variability. But at the end of the day, as you were pointing out previously, initially there are minimal changes in lactate and then they begin to increase more rapidly thereafter. So people like to look at that and say, okay, here's the first uptick in mm -hmm. some subjective manner, we'll call that LT1. Mm -hmm. And then we know that there is a, a maximal lactate steady state. It's hard to determine from an incremental exercise test, but somewhere out there is an LT2, right? The onset of continual blood lactate accumulation. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with all of this is that it's really a continuum. And if you threw an exponential curve on there, that would fit better than any kind of piecewise linear regression, right? There are no actual breakpoints. Uh, and as a consequence, like a, uh, you know, uh, Ira Jacobs demonstrated a single blood lactate measurement, if it, you know, at the right intensity, at say you know, 200 watts is as predictive as doing, you know, a full curve. Okay. You just need to know one lactate value, right? Because it tells you where the curve is positioned and is all a continuum. Um, right, so that's so, why you said it's not different. Yeah, just when you said LT1 and LT2 aren't different, I just didn't want people to think they were the same yeah. exact lactate measurement. Yeah, You're yeah. just saying they're, they're just a continuum. You might as well just do one. They're, they're a distinction without a difference. Is that the <laughs> phrase? Right. <laughs> and remember how people used to, I don't know if they still do, but I tried to do it once in a while. And, uh, you know, they tried to say, okay, when the lactate does this, the ventilation does that. And then you, you, know, you try and draw the, the lactate breakpoints against the ventilation breakpoints. You do that in tracks yeah. and things. And uh, it's hard to, it's a bit of yeah. a, yeah. And then you can dissociate ventilatory yeah. threshold from lactate threshold by, you know, McArdle's disease, the classic, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. by pedaling really fast, by pedaling really slow, by having really high glycogen, by having really low glycogen. If you do interval training, it tends to increase your ventilatory threshold more than your lactate threshold. If you do continuous training, it tends to increase your lactate threshold more than your ventilatory threshold. So we have lots of evidence out there that they aren't cause and effect, even though they may, uh, in, mm -hmm. you know, terms of human physiology, yeah, they tend to be closely associated. Uh, they're clearly uh, not cause and effect. Sorry, Carlman Wasserman. Uh, okay. So so the so with the zone two, yeah. Now why don't we talk about why are people so uh, so I started talking about on tw you know Twitter. It's just zone two, zone two. And I even gave it I gave a talk on a couple of podcasts and then, you know, as I do on Twitter, I ask people with this questions and there's a question like I was going to talk about, you know, carbohydrate metabolism during exercise. And one of the questions is, oh, you know, ask him about zone two, you know, just everything's zone yeah. two. Why don't you give us a background on, you know, how people are, why they're so keen on this zone, zone two. Um, so, you know, in terms of fat yeah. oxidation, lactate, all that stuff. There's, there's been a, you know, a long standing misconception that you need to oxidize fat 
in order to become better at oxidizing fat. Uh, in reality, your muscles are quite good at oxidizing fat, even in the untrained state. At rest, for example, muscle relies almost entirely on fatty acid oxidation to provide its rather low energy needs. But if carbohydrate availability is restricted, you can exercise all the way up to, you know, 70% of VO2 max to use my classic exercise physiologist anchor point VO2 max um, with an R of 0.7. Um, it's not necessarily pleasant, but you can provide the energy. Uh, that said, you know, since uh, Halsey's work in the late 1960s, uh, it's been known that endurance exercise training increases the capacity of muscle to oxidize fat as a fuel source. Um, but you don't have to oxidize fat to actually induce those adaptations. They're primarily the result of an increase in you know, mitochondrial respiratory capacity, where the two primary drivers are the energetic state of the muscle you know, during exercise training um, and calcium release. And it's these factors are what you know, cause you to produce more uh, mitochondria, which then results in an increase in oxygen fat oxidation capacity. You don't actually have to oxidize fat to get better at oxidizing fat. Yet people have long thought that you need to. Yeah, so just to make sure, because you mentioned the R of 0.7, to make sure people are clear on this. So the idea is that, you know, we know that when you're exercising in a low, so as you said, sitting at rest, unless you've just had a high carbohydrate meal, but sit, sitting at rest, if you're fasted, you're burning mainly fat. You start exercising low intensity, you're burning mainly fat. As it gets harder and harder, you burn more. So we, we, we'd often say, the, yeah, the studies, Rominge, et cetera, Van Loon, you know, and, and earlier stuff, 65% in a trained person of VO2 max is about where you're 50-50. And then when it, you go harder, it becomes more carbohydrate. So the idea there is, is when your respiratory exchange ratio is 0.7, you're burning 100% fat, essentially. When it's one, you're burning 100% carbohydrate. So you're saying if you're on a, on a high fat, low carbohydrate diet, you can exercise maybe at 70% and be burning almost entirely fat. But, yes. but the idea there is that the people are thinking, okay, I want to get better at burning fat so I can spare my muscle glycogen. I can do better in exercising. But and and, you, that, and that's said, a valid thought. That's a valid thought. Yes. But, but then the question is, how do you do that? And the way exactly. you do but that you're is saying you... you do not need to burn fat to learn how to burn right. fat more. You just want to increase your mitochondrial volume. Yep. And you can do that by various means. Oh, yeah. Many means. Um, mm. if, if you look at the animal literature, these are not new questions, obviously. Uh, but if you go back to the animal literature, uh, so again, uh, Dudley, 1984. Uh, some of the work out of Halsey's lab in the mid, late, mid to late 70s, you know, training rats at different intensities, different durations, et cetera. Uh, it seems that, you know, muscle respiratory capacity increases with increasing intensity of training, in part because you're recruiting more and more motor units, right? It increases with increasing duration of daily training up to about two hours a day. And then beyond that, in a rat, uh, it doesn't seem like you can necessarily induce you know, markedly greater improvements. Now, stimulate the muscle eight hours a day or 24 hours a day, and you may get some further increase. Uh, but there clearly is a a big bang for the buck, uh, you know, mm. when you first start that working the muscle. And yeah. then eventually, you know, a tendency to sort of saturate the system. Um, mm -hmm. So then, you know, that leads into all kinds of practical questions about, well, what's the best training program? Uh, and then it devolves off into, well, what are you training for? Who are you? How much time do you have available? How much motivation do you have, et cetera? Um, and Ultimately, at the level of the individual, science can't really answer those questions, right? Mm -hmm. You see people posting on a forum, hey, I'm, you know, so many years old. I've been training this way for a few months. My FTP is up to this. What are the odds I can get it up to five watts per kilogram? It's like, well, there's only one way to find out. <laughs> is it Yoda, right? It's like, uh, do or do not. There is no try, <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. So 
So basically, there's a couple of things t- talking about there, but, but but we know that there's different ways of increasing your fat oxidation. You don't have to exercise at low intensity burning fat to get there. So classic stuff, you know, the the high the, the whole hit stuff, the you know the high intensity intermittent training. There's there's lots of evidence that you get essentially the same increases in in VO two max. You get same increases in your uh, mitochondrial enzymes, etc. So that's showing very clearly. And you're right. saying, even if you don't burn much fat at all, just say you're doing intervals right. twice a day, every day, if you get an increase in mitochondrial volume, uh, so you get the increases in, ox- in you know, the oxidative enzymes, the fat enzymes, then you'll burn more fat during the exercise. Uh, correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, now, what about this thing, though, that people are worried about? Ah, oh, but when I'm exercising, um, if I go too hard, I'll get lactate and that's going to inhibit my lipolysis. So, so for a start, I guess you're saying, well, who cares anyway, because you don't have to be burning fat during exercise. But do you want to just talk around that concept? Yeah. So, so the, the misconception that uh, you need to oxidize fat in order to get better at burning fat has been around for a long time. The, the current uh, myth that, oh, it, you know, if I go too hard early in a workout, it takes a long time to reset my metabolism seems to be coming entirely from uh, San Milan and his recent podcasts. Um, and I think people are paying attention because of who he coaches. I can't pronounce his name. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but the idea that lactate inhibits lipolysis, which I believe is what San Milan is uh, resting his uh, belief system on, actually goes back to a hypothesis from the 1960s where uh, uh, Bella Izikitz, and I don't remember his wife's name, but Izikitz and Izikitz. So this was in the, the heyday of carbon-14 based metabolic tracers, and Izikitz studied exercising dogs with, uh, you know, 14C labeled glucose, 14C labeled fatty acids, et cetera, et cetera. It is true that if you go, you know, hard during exercise and your lactate levels are elevated, your fatty acid levels will be suppressed. Mm-hmm. And uh, Izikitz and Izikitz hypothesized that lactate inhibits lipolysis. What we know now and what we've known since, you know, as long as I've been in the field, right, uh, is that that hypothesis is incorrect. The the real explanation for why fatty acids are suppressed during high-intensity exercise is that they require uh, blood flow and albumin delivery to adipose tissue to remove the fatty acids or to liberate, let's say, release the fatty acids. Mm. Uh, because fatty acids are not water soluble and the albumin in your plasma is basically the shuttle bus. Mm -hmm. So during high intensity exercise, when you uh, redistribute more of the blood flow away from adipose tissue, you may have a high rate of sympathetically mediated fat breakdown, i.e. lipolysis, but the fatty acids can't escape Mm -hmm. from the adipocytes. Then when you stop exercise or lower the intensity and, you know, you get more blood flow into the adipose tissue, uh, fatty acids will actually rebound. Overshoot. And so, you, so mm. they can show a big overshoot post-exercise. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, how long does all of this take? I, you know, and what effect that has time-wise on muscle metabolism? Uh, you know, it's something that's difficult to study absolutely because some of our tools like indirect calorimetry require a steady state. And so if you were cycling, cycling, if you were fluctuating power every 30 seconds, well, indirect calorimetry is not a tool that would really be helpful there. But for my dissertation, one of the projects, we had cyclists who were drilling it at time trial pace for 15 minutes. And then they went at, you know, um, easy pace for 15 minutes. And then they altered, alternated that as long as they could. And you see this little, you know, uh, seesaw action in terms of fatty acid levels, in terms of glycerol levels, et cetera, every 15 minutes uh, where fatty acids go down during the intense exercise and then up during the easier exercise and then back down again. And in that case, we were using respiratory exchange ratio over the last five minutes of each 15 minute block. And if you look at the metabolic uh, rates of substrate oxidation, plasma concentrations of substrates, et cetera, 
uh, during the moderate intensity blocks, they mm -hmm. look pretty much the same as if the high intensity blocks never took place. Uh, okay. So, so that says you must reset within 10 minutes, reset, right? Quote unquote. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. You think about uh, elevation of plasma catecholamines. Well, plasma catecholamines have a very short half-life. You know, you go really hard at the, uh, in an in attack during a race and your catecholamines go really high and then the brake is caught and you tuck back into the field and draft for a minute or two, they're right back where they were because they're cleared so rapidly. So this whole notion that, you know, it takes a prolonged period of time to reset metabolism has no physiological basis whatsoever. Um, in addition to the fact that you don't, you know, who cares? <laughs> because you don't have to burn fat in order to get better at burning fat. Um, right. But there is this concept, I, I guess, that, you know. The, the, you, the ultimate uh -huh. killer here. I can't uh -huh. resist this. The there ultimate killer, right? Uh, George Brooks's lab did an interesting study where they did a lactate clamp. So mm -hmm. they infused unlabeled lactate to elevate mm -hmm. lactate levels. And then they also... Uh, since lactate is a base, if you just infuse like sodium lactate, you'll become alkalotic. They also infused enough acid in order to maintain okay. pH, right? Mm -hmm. So at a moderate intensity, they could increase lactate concentrations as if you were exercising at a higher intensity mm -hmm. and then hold them there, a lactate quote unquote clamp, much like the classic glucose clamp. And they were using stable isotope tracers to measure substrate kinetics, including the rate of appearance of glycerol which is produced as a result of the breakdown of triglycerides in adipose tissue and muscle, um, is considered the best measure of the rate of lipolysis. And when they elevated lactate concentrations, there was no significant difference mm -hmm. in the rate of appearance of glycerol. In fact, it actually tended to be higher in the lactate clamp study. Wow, okay. Whereas if lactate suppressed lipolysis, it should have diminished the rate of appearance Absolutely. of glycerol. And I only bring this up because, you know, the grand irony here is that San Milan uh, is, seems to be, you know, uh, heavily influenced by George Brooks. <laughs> oh, um, but not in that regard. Apparently not. <laughs> so. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that I don't pull. Much... I don't pull punches, as you said earlier, right? Okay. I I think that pretty much covers that. But if Sam Milan was here, how would he respond to that? Do you think? Well, and again, I you know I don't want to point the finger too hard because, in quite on you know quite honestly, I can't stand listening to podcasts. Um, so I. Hey, hang on! Don't turn people off listening to podcasts. <laughs> I don't <laughs> even listen to my own on this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, people talk too slowly for me. I'd rather read it, <laughs> draw a graph, give me, you know, give me words. Um, I, I, if it's how to repair my dryer, I'll watch the video. But only I'll just cut like that out. I'm going to, I'll modify <laughs> it for you to say, okay. everyone listen to the podcast. Yeah, I, okay. I, the only podcast I listen to is Inside Exercise. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm basing this more on uh, what I'm reading on various web fora, et cetera. Um, so it's possible that uh, his message is getting distorted a little bit before it gets to me. That's quite possible. Mm -hmm. um, hey, I, I thought earlier when you were talking about heart rate, um, so, you know, back when people were, you know, before people were thinking about lactate thresholds and uh, power zones and things, exercising on heart rate. And that's another one that that, that you get cardiovascular drift, right? So if you, because I've had, I've heard people quite often say, I'm going to run this, um, you know, I'm going to run at 140 beats today. I said, you know, but if you're doing like a two hour run or something, you're going to have to slow down, you know, like because right. you get this cardiovascular drift. Do you have right. any thoughts on that? Because I know you said we, we just well, talked about. Well, that, uh, uh, yeah. We had one of the pithy power proverbs was cardiac drift is a fact of life. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, you're never going to have a perfectly constant heart rate that your heart muscle itself will fatigue during prolonged, you know, moderate intensity exercise. Uh, it's the, the reddest of the red, the slowest of the slow, the most fatigue resistant muscle. Uh, but it, it, it may exhibit some evidence of diminished function as a result of prolonged intense exercise, i.e. cardiac fatigue. And how well your heart functions is also heavily dependent upon the environment in which it's operating, filling pressures, et cetera. So as you warm up and you 
have to vasodilate your skin to cool yourself. You may have diminished, you know, central cardiovascular uh, pressure, which will reduce stroke volume. You're no longer stretching the heart. You can't take advantage of the Frank Starling mechanism as well. Yet you need to maintain cardiac output to provide the oxygen to the exercising muscles. And now you have to send more blood out to perfuse mm -hmm. the skin. And if stroke volume is going down, the only thing you can do is increase heart rate. You know, just pump faster. Right. So, you know, even in a laboratory based setting where you are, you know, uh, well below any kind of uh, major disruption to metabolic homeostasis, um, well below, you know, quote unquote, lactate threshold, critical power, maximal metabolic steady state, functional threshold power, Fat whatever max. you want to call uh, yeah, whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, you'll see some upward drift in heart rate, uh, even just core temperature increasing over time, causing, you know, AV node to depolarize more rapidly, more readily. So what cardiac drift aerobic is a decoupling fact of life. Business? What's this aerobic decoupling? Uh... Uh, it's cardiac drift. Yeah. So that's just and cardiac drift. That's just cardiac drift. What's yeah. this aerobic decoupling business? Well, it's... Uh, I think Joe Friel is the one who came up with that term. Um, you know, a perfectly coupled mitochondria, mitochondrion, there's not really a single one, but a perfectly coupled mitochondrion, uh, the, in theory, the, the P to O ratio should be, you know, three. We get three ATP produced for every uh, one half of an O2 yes. utilized, right? Mm -hmm. Mitochondria, you know, even in a healthy person are not perfectly coupled. Um, but they can become less well coupled. They can become uncoupled. It could be due to mitochondrial diseases. It could be due to uncoupling proteins that are expressed within the muscle. Uh, it can be due to uh, chemicals, drugs, known as a mitochondrial uncoupler. So people would, you know, in Indiana, they'd, uh, you know, poison a pond with rotenone and all the dead fish would float to the surface, you know. Mm -hmm. thought it was a cool thing to do. Um, oh, was uh, it? Okay. I thought so, it was weird enough how they painted the river green. So when, you know, cause I went to Ball yeah. State as well. I couldn't yeah. believe it. There I was, I just started the environment. There was no environment group at Ball State in 1989. So I started one It's called common ground. I'm more worried about the environment. And then it's St. Patrick's day and the rivers uh, died green. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> anyway, I need, to tell, you about, I need to tell you about my new electric car someday. Um. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so anyway, I just thought aerobic decoupling. I mean, there's so much more so, going on. Yeah. So, so I think I think <clears throat> I think Joe Joe Friel kind of uh, you know conflated the two, or just borrowed the term uncoupling, decoupling, um, and you know came up with aerobic decoupling, but it's really just cardiac drift. The uh, terminology aside, and any. Uh, confusion that might create. The biggest issue here is it's been proposed that when your cardiac drift is below, you know, a certain amount, then that's a sign that your base is fully developed and it's time to move on with your training. Um, well, we, yeah, you're shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we know that endurance exercise training uh, reduces cardiac drift, but sure. really that's a, that's a measure of or a reflection of your cardiovascular fitness, right? Mm. Yet, uh, you know, performance is mostly dependent upon your muscular metabolic fitness. And you know, where this arbitrary cut point uh, comes from in the first place is also you know, totally unclear, right? Um, you know, I, mm. I, think it's, I think it's basically you, you pursue the type of training necessary to maximize the capabilities required for your chosen event, and you keep doing that until you stop making forward progress performance-wise. Yeah, so performance and, and is, it, the, is, the, uh, is the end yeah. point. What did you, you, keep, you keep saying it? Performance is the best indicator of performance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the best predictor of performance is performance itself. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, you know, there you are. You're a cyclist. You took some time off in the fall. You trained diligently over the winter. You've been progressively increasing the, the volume, frequency, intensity of your training all spring long. And you keep working at it. You keep working at it. And finally, you're reaching a point where things aren't going up anymore. Well, you know, there's either, you know, one of two things to do at that point. It's either change your training, mm -hmm. you know, uh, focus on some other aspect or it's time to go racing, right? Because, uh, you know, 
you're not necessarily going to make any further progress by just keeping, you know, keep beating your head against the wall. Um, but also, you know, don't stop beating your head against the wall if you're still improving just because of some, you know, aerobic decoupling says I should. Um, so I think several times we've talked about how, you know, there's different ways of training to get the same sort of responses. And then this fits well with, um, so last week I spoke with Michael Joyner, so I'm going to put his up in a few days time. So about the sort of the history of endurance training. And one of the things he talked about, which fits perfectly with this was, um, you know, you talk about sometimes this, this concept of all roads lead to Rome. So can you end up the same sort of athlete? by doing different types of training. And he had the great the great comment because he said in the Tokyo Olympics, it was like all roads lead to Tokyo because in the 5,000 meters, um, you know, the, the, the first, second and third were all within a meter of each other and they had totally different training. So one was like mainly this long, slow distance. One was intervals twice a day. One was a combination, whatever. So, so I guess that fits what we're talking about, right? We don't have to sort of obsess about, oh, I need to be doing this. And then even the thing you said about racing, he said, even the people that that did, did long, slow distance, people said, oh, well, that's all you need to do. And he said, no, they actually would race once yeah. a week or once every couple of weeks. So they are getting that high intensity training. Right. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll credit my wife at this point. You know, her argument back when she was racing was that, you know, there is no such thing as the perfect training plan. You know, you keep it, yeah. You know, Jimmy Buffett style, keep it between the navigational beacons, right? Within within broad parameters, within broad strokes, you know, make sure what you're doing is appropriate and reasonable. And then the outcome, how successful you become, ends up hinging a lot more upon, well, how much talent you have, how much motivation you have, you know, the environment you're in, the, you know, support you have, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And not, oh, well, you know, I, I, you know, went and got a laboratory-based test so that I could train right at or below my, uh, right above my LT1 because, you know, so-and-so says this is the optimal way of doing so. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, and again, I mean, you think about the literature, the scientific literature and how much people want to hang their hats on, you know, single studies, small ends, when really, science isn't good for answering a lot of these questions or at least or especially on the individual level i mean what we do know what do we know about training well we can we can describe in great detail the effects of training you know down to you know what genes are being switched on what are switched off uh, but when it comes time to prescribing a training program um, really what we have are only the big principles specificity overload right um reversibility etc uh, well, that's what i was going to say as well just you said specificity so i didn't i don't want to give people to get the impression that no matter what training you do you end up the same because if if you did just do long slow distance then you're only teaching yourself to go slow right and you go then and try and do a you know i, I was more a runner so you go and try and do a 10k race you're going to do crap because you haven't done anything at sort of anywhere near race pace yeah. yeah. And, and and then, you know, we have to think in terms of different sports as well. As you said, in running, I mean, the biomechanics of running slow are different from the biomechanics of running fast. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're pedaling a bike, I mean, it's the same crank length, the same saddle height, you know, the same two pistons going up and down at about the same, you know, RPM. And mm -hmm. all that's really changing is motor unit recruitment. Uh, mm -hmm. And okay, well, I need to train my, you know, more difficult to recruit type two motor units will just ride long enough and your type ones will become fatigued. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, it's different when you start talking about running and then, you know, again, my son's a swimmer and I start thinking about uh, what Jim Martin kind of refers to as duty cycle. If you look at uh, swimming or rowing, although they're primarily aerobic sports, the, uh, the duty cycle is much longer. It's like when you, turn the muscles on they have to stay on for a much longer period of time because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. your stroke rates are lower both swimming and rowing than they would be you know say your uh step rate while running or your kids mm -hmm. while cycling mm -hmm. and then you know what are the implications for this as i have to think through it it's like well uh most of the blood flow occurs when the muscles relax not when it's contracting because when it's contracting, intramuscular pressure is too high and you don't get much blood flow. Um, and then you start thinking about, well, how important is are the muscle contractile properties 
as a limiter versus you know energy turnover, et cetera. So you start getting really into the details here uh, with a particular sport. But it, back to you know back to kind of training zones and, and Mike's uh, comments. I had long made the point in USA coaching education clinics that on the one hand, the adaptations to exercise training are enormously complex. You know, we alter the expression of thousands of genes, right? Uh, and yet, on the other hand, from another perspective, they're really quite simple. Everything that happens either increases the maximal force or power that the muscle can generate, mm -hmm. or it increases the duration at which the muscle can maintain a submaximal force or power output. Yeah, yeah. So you have type, I say type one, let's say you have type A and type B adaptations, right? And then you could probably subdivide the type B adaptations into those that enhance fatigue resistance during you know, very high intensity, non-sustainable exercise. You know, you're running 400 meters, you're doing a cycling pursuit or whatever, versus those that enhance fatigue resistance during, you know, more prolonged, lower intensity exercise, 10K, running a marathon, time trial, whatever. Um, and so these, uh, uh, the B1 and the B2 may be subtly different, um, but really in broad strokes, that's it. And everything else is details, you know, best left under the hood for the exercise molecular biologists, right? Um, it's like, what kind of adaptation are you trying to pursue? Well, there's only three. <laughs> so, okay, well, you know, what are the adaptations and how do I induce them? Well, like you said, uh, over broad spectrum, you can do anything from, you know, very prolonged uh, lower intensity exercise, or you can do, uh, you know, short intense interval training and how does the muscle respond more capillaries more mitochondria uh you know probably going to decrease your glycolytic glycogenolytic enzymes a little bit you're going to reduce your ldh you know a fair bit you're going to produce more glute 4 transporters it's like there's only like one program mm -hmm. by which the muscle can respond over very broad swaths you know I mean, that's, that's one of the things that, you know, my wife was a track cyclist and I didn't really come to fully appreciate uh, cycling as a sport until I got to know her. Because if you don't consider what happens on the track, it's like going to athletics, track and field, and only watching the marathon and not going to the stadium, right? Mm. I mean, you need to bring in the velodrome, the true match sprinters, the true sprint cyclists, the BMXers, before you start talking about you know, the very far left end of the intensity duration spectrum in terms of cycling. But once you get out beyond, you know, a handful of minutes, it's all the same thing, you know? <clears throat> all right, great. All right, so I think we've covered this. I was just having a bit of a look at uh, some of these Twitter questions. I think I think we've basically covered a lot of them, uh, you know, without specifically asking the question. Uh, so Jim Kalane's zones imply there are some metabolic anchors. FTP is not that. CP is not that critical power. Lactate threshold is. Yeah, and I would, I, mm. I would, I would dispute that. Um, in that, again, uh, physiological responses take place on a continuum. Uh, you could say that they are threshold-like even recognizing that it occurs on a continuum. I mean, the it, it is a, a, there is an elbow in the curve. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a fairly narrow range of intensities over where we can do a pretty good job of maintaining a metabolic steady state and then go just a little bit harder and the, uh, you know, the wheels are all going to progressively fall off. Um, so, this is why I refer to it as a quasi-metabolic steady state, because even if you're below that intensity, you can't maintain a perfect metabolic steady state forever. You know, VO2 will drift upwards even below critical power, um, mm -hmm. et cetera. And, you know, even if you adjusted the power output and you know, measured VO2 frequently with a metabolic cart and kept tweaking the power output to try and keep VO2 constant, um, 
okay, power is going to decline, but also you, like your catecholamines would go up over time. Your heart rate would go up over time. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is no true uh, metabolic steady state. You can't maintain resting metabolic rate for longer than what four score and 10 right <laughs> duration of your life right <laughs> even that low of an intensity can't be maintained forever that's true. Um, so so that's why i refer to it as a quasi metabolic steady state uh, but recognizing all of those nuances nonetheless it's it's uh a fairly narrow range over which things begin to change rather rapidly. And because performance is dependent upon the metabolic responses to exercise, that becomes the, the logical place to anchor any kind of, uh, you know, training prescription. Um, and, you know, these are not new thoughts. These are ideas that have been in the exercise science field for, you know, as long as I've been around and they keep resurfacing. So you can probably find, you know, didn't David Bishop do a review somewhat recently where he's making the exact same argument you know i'm sitting there looking at it going 30 years ago we knew this why do we need another review well we we blame av hill and vo2 max because he got there first in 1924 right and it's taken a long time <laughs> to undermine you know that perspective um but then, the, then the, the devil is in the details right okay if we all accept that there is some reasonable anchor point in there between sustainable and non-sustainable intensity, how do we go about determining it, right? Is it best to base it on physiological measurements? I would argue, and Andy Jones would apparently agree, no, it's actually best to base it upon performance measurements, power mm -hmm. if it's a measurable kind of thing. And then you can get further into the devil in the details there. Well, do you use 95% of 20 minute power, you know, which is what Hunter Allen has proposed, or do you use critical power testing, but that's getting way off into the weeds. Um, All right. So, so um, one of the questions was Simon Marwood, and you've just talked about that. We you know what is a quasi steady state? So you've talked about that. Uh, I'm just, I'm just trying to see if we've covered things now. Ho Jose Manuel Valverde. Ah, so he talks about the thing you said already. So Dr. Inigo San Milan always emphasizes that the introduction of high intensity in a zone two ride negates its benefits as high intensity efforts hinder aerobic pathways. So talking about the lactate for several minutes afterwards, uh, this is hard to achieve outside of. So if you're an un undulating course, how much is it, is it, of this is relevant? So you, we've talked about that. Yeah, none, none whatsoever. Uh, you know, you 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 go for a Strava Prime at the start of your three-hour ride, uh, and you blow yourself to bits. Yeah, the rest of your workout may not be of the highest quality, especially if your fitness isn't really there. Um, so maybe that's not the best plan on a regular basis. Uh, but in terms of the physiology, mm -hmm. you know, the physiology doesn't really care. Think big picture, right? Actually, just um, just back to the thing I asked at the start, and I remember we had some emails about it a couple of years ago. What was this controversy about FTP versus suffer score, the suffer fest? Oh, thing? right. What we we that dropped thing? that. Um, mm. I'm not sure. And maybe you're uh, mixing a couple things. Uh, Wahoo Quite Fitness. possibly. <laughs> yeah. Wahoo Fitness, uh, they, you know, they had a whole advertising campaign. FTP is dead. And then they started hyping 4DP, four dimensional power. Oh, that's that is, right. you, mm -hmm. you characterize somebody's, uh, you know, exercise or somebody's performance abilities on the basis of their maximal five second, one minute, five minute, and, you know, sustainable right. power, mm -hmm. which is the power profiling idea that I had introduced a yeah, decade or more before. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. Um, you know, That's what it was. It was apparently it was those... the people behind Wahoo don't have any ethics, right? I mean, this is, this is the, <laughs> I'll be blunt. <laughs> this oh. is the very definition of plagiarism, right? Using somebody else's words or ideas without giving proper credit, right? Um, well, it's actually worse because they they said FTP is dead. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> makes no sense, does it? Right? <laughs> they're plagiarizing, no but they also put knock down the thing they're plagiarizing. Oh, lots of ways to make money in this world. Is that a defamational? <laughs> these defamational comments or not? Okay, so. Um, Right. So I, I think if we covered pretty much everything, I, I didn't see all the Twitter because some came, I just got up out of bed and I, some more Twitter comments came through, but I think we pretty much covered 
everything. So what would your takeaway, I guess, if we're talking about uh, takeaway messages from this um, and thinking about the topic, so you know, why all the talk about Zone 2, what would you like people to take away uh, rather than just like, yeah. I'm, I'm going to tip my hat to you here um, because – you know, the, your, your motivation for the podcast was the fact that there is a lot of misinformation out there. There are a lot of scientists who are getting their hands dirty working in the field who are the best source of information, the, the closest to the truth, right? And yet we live in an ivory tower where we're, we're not incentivized to share with the public. Mm -hmm. Instead, you know, we're incentivized to chase grants, build our careers, you know, pay our summer salaries. And I'm, I am both a, a, a product and a victim of that entire uh system and I recognize it right um so I, I'll tip my hat for you for recognizing that you know you have an opportunity here to provide the uh the pipeline the uh, insight uh into exercise so in that context aside from telling people you know listen the inside exercise is my favorite podcast the only one I listen to uh, <laughs> I in more big picture I would say is uh you know be a skeptical consumer of information mm -hmm. and truly consider the source. I mean, it's not that hard to get a PhD in exercise science, right? <laughs> Just because somebody has credentials behind their name doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. Just because somebody is connected and, you know, has a bunch of really successful athletes doesn't mean that they necessarily know what they're talking about. Um, so be a skeptical consumer and yeah, you kind of have to triangulate amongst, you know, various sources of mm -hmm. information. But the other part of it is to realize that, you know, why are you, why are you interested in the first place, right? I mean, we're all curious creatures and there are probably many people who, even if they aren't going to try and apply it to their own training, it is how they entertain themselves they listen to peter atisha or something like that right mm -hmm. uh while they make their commute to work um passes the time while they're in the car um but uh it's sometimes it's also just a distraction mm -hmm. and so it's like keep your eyes on the prize don't be confused because the biggest mistake people make is they they basically jump from the latest you know they jump from one training Bad. approach to another training mm -hmm. approach. They respond to the latest guru. You know, back when uh, Lance Armstrong was winning the Tour de France and Chris Carmichael was, you know, walked on water, everybody's like, oh, I got to spin to win. I got to spin to win, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you see, you live long enough, you see these things come and go <laughs> and you realize what matters are the big principles. Um, so, you know, don't don't get distracted by all of the talk um hey okay that's great just thinking as something else i thought of the other day is do people partly want to do zone two because it's easy you know so if you're gonna ride your bike and you go oh i should do I, zone I, two I was, today well you know I was, I was thinking about the same sort of thing uh although there is depending on how much time you have available people like steve seiler have you know uh cautioned against the no-go zone right spending all of your time going happy hard right? Um, actually going happy hard is a good way of inducing adaptation. People ask about, well, is sweet spot, you know, where's the scientific evidence that sweet spot training is effective? It's like, do the math, dude. Almost every endurance exercise training study ever published has taken untrained people and trained them in the sweet spot because that's mm -hmm. what we as exercise physiologists do, right? We know that it's effective. You're not going to get improvements in a college student training six hours a week at 50% of VO2 max, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, a, no, what do we do? We put them, you know, pretty darn hard, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> sweet spot. Um, so uh, again, though, I, I was thinking about it. It's like there is some... We, we have three levers we can pull, frequency, duration, and intensity of training, right? And most people would take frequency and duration together and call that the volume of your training, right? Mm -hmm. So you have volume and you have intensity. Um, what is the optimal volume? I mean, like I said, my son's a swimmer. My wife and I debate these things endlessly, right? Uh, there are high school swim programs here in Indiana. Uh, well, we're not in Indiana, but near in, in Indiana uh, at home. Um, 
where you know, they have high school kids, kids training 20 hours a week. My son trains 10 hours a week. Well, my mm-hmm. wife and I are convinced that he would be faster if he trained more. Um, but how much more? You know, my on an individual basis, the only way to know is to you know do more right. until you until you crack, right? Mm-hmm. But my my experience, my gut instinct, what have you, is that somewhere around you know the 15 hour a week mark is where you're starting to trade intensity for volume that all roads leave to Rome, right? Mm-hmm. But okay, let's say you're choosing, you're training 15 hours a week and I want to get better. I got to go hard. That's not pleasant, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so how much motivation do you have to have to do that, you know, 52 weeks a year, right? Or is it easier just to ride more and have fun, you know, and all roads lead to Rome, right? Um, so, there, you know, there, there are more, there are, there's, you know, there's more than one way to skin the training cat. <laughs> um, what we do know is that intensity is a uh, significant factor. You could take any highly trained athlete, and if you put them into a pressure cooker training program short term, you can probably get further improvements or you'll crack them, one of the two, right? Um, but I think somebody like, you know, your average pro cyclist is probably running around anywhere, you know, depending on the time of year, five to 15% below their maximum performance ability, depending upon, you know, what parameter you're talking about, because it's a job and I've got to do this, you know, 50 weeks out of the year. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can't have my nose to the grindstone 50 weeks out of the year, uh, motivation, right dries up actually that that re- that reminded me of something to tie together because earlier on when you're talking about your vo2 max and your lactate threshold I, I wanted to to make sure people are clear on that and i think this is a good example so show 1988 showed tour de france cyclists when you look at them over a season their vo2 max did not change over the season but their performance and their their mitochondrial enzymes changed 300 percent yeah so that's yeah. the good to tie that together. The, the performance is more related to your peripheral. Yeah. Um, you don't actually have to do that much to keep your VO2 max. Um, and it doesn't close. really change yeah. that much. Yeah, exactly. Um, it doesn't lot, change yeah. that much once it's up already. Yeah. Um, all right, great. So just a, 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 a final uh, takeaway, takeaway, just specifically to the zone two stuff. What's your takeaway? So if someone gets off this, and then gets on Twitter and it's like, you've got to do everything at zone two. What would you say to them? What's your takeaway on that? I, well, I, I think I, I, my gut is to say the same thing again. Yeah, think exactly. of the big picture. Um, mm-hmm. That, you know, the, the keys to training are the big uh, factors, specificity, overload, progression, you know, reversibility, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. So, I mean, I had a, a, a mental map, you know, if you were designing the training program for an athlete, you know, it's like, what are the demands of the event from a physiological perspective? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what are the characteristics of this athlete with respect to the demands of the event? How to best prepare this athlete for this event, right? Or maybe they should pick a different event because they would, you know, be more successful at something else. So that's mm-hmm. like an exit from the circle. But mm-hmm. if you don't exit from the circle, you just keep coming back to the same question. What are the demands of the event? What are the current <laughs> characteristics yeah. of the athlete? It's like, okay, well, we've raised your muscular metabolic fitness about as high as we possibly can. We might be able to get a little bit more if you wanted to do time trials, but you're targeting the pursuit. You're my wife. Okay, so it's instead now it's time to focus on you know, icing the cake by, you know, VO2 max intervals and then a whole bunch of, you know, quote unquote anaerobic capacity intervals, uh, the uh, go hard, puke, go home style of training, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because that's what, to do a one-off, you know, three kilometer pursuit as fast as possible, those are the capabilities that you need. Um, So. Specificity. All right. And then I was just thinking also, if someone was saying, what about if I'm not an athlete, I'm not training, for, I, I want to do it for health. I guess you'd say zone two may not be ideal for that either, because even though you might get the metabolic sort of, you know, you might 
reduce your blood pressure and cholesterol and things by doing a lot of low intensity type exercise um i know from with ben levine was on here he said you need to do a bit higher intensity to get the cardiovascular responses you want so, yeah oh uh, i mean people are doing it for health uh, presumably they're talking about doing it for the rest of their life right <laughs> hopefully they're not you know, yeah. yeah um so it has to be something sustainable something they enjoy doing and mm -hmm. something they can fit into their life etc uh within that if it's too intense you know you'll burn out and you'll jump from trainer road to full gas to swift to uh, you know doing nothing to you know yeah, just uh, playing pickleball to back on the bike because the pandemic hit and, you know etc but at least you're mm -hmm. doing something right yeah, um yeah. But if you're going to pick one sport and you're just going to do it, again, it still has to be sustainable. It still has to be something you enjoy. Uh, there is, you know, the other, the, at the far end of things, is it possible to go too hard? Um, there's emerging evidence in the cardiovascular disease realm that, you know, high intensity exercise could increase uh formation of uh calcium containing plaques mm -hmm. in the coronary arteries uh there are some case reports you know like 10 percent out of a cohort of 30 and then several papers right uh where you know people like me who've done a lot of high or you um we may have evidence of uh myocardial fibrosis based on MRI scans. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you start looking at you know, mortality, et cetera, um, there's nothing, I mean, an acute bout of high intensity exercise increases your risk of sudden death, both while you're doing it immediately thereafter. But doing it on a repeated basis actually in, exactly reduces your risk and so despite mm -hmm. you know the cac scores data out there the fibrosis changes etc um it's still you know unknown whether these things have any true clinical significance well uh, again I'd, I'd i'd uh point people in the direction of ben levine's uh podcast yeah. on that yeah, because, he's, um, he'd, he'd be the expert yeah <laughs> no because the, the good one was he did say uh, that there's more calcification of plaques and things but they're yeah. more stable they're actually yep. not yeah we used to talk so, about uh mm -hmm. vulnerable and, and vulnerable plaques right yeah so, so the they're more stable are, yeah so they, they actually even the people that have the more calcified plaques tend yeah. to live longer and that there can yep. be also increased atrial fibrillation yeah. but there's still a lot more better more uh, lower mortality so yeah. yeah so that's an interesting discussion all right so um thank you very much maybe, maybe i'll have to watch that episode uh, there you go <laughs> um there you go so thank you very much again for coming on andy and i'd like to point if we're plugging other episodes you're you know as i said at the start the first the very first episode was with andy coggan talking about his nitrates and exercise uh stuff which is really interesting as well so enjoy your holiday and i okay. uh, hope you don't have to spend too much time and annoy your family here with um you know, i got i got i got Ryan's. one out of three down now right <laughs> you're gonna end up in the bad books okay yeah okay good to good see you again you. glenn thanks andy see you till 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 next year okay <laughs> bye 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 see you i hope you enjoyed this podcast um please like subscribe pass it on to your friends and colleagues check out the other podcasts thanks again